If you'll all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So the reason we're all here today is because we all know or have learned or have certainly heard about the suicide rates of our veterans, our first responders, and even our students. The ranges for students range from, or the numbers we, we hear about suicides or death by suicide, I guess is the official term, it ranges from 15 a day to 28 a day, depends on the survey that you're looking at. Our American Legion National Commander, Vincent Jim Triola, his campaign was to address the suicide situation that we have, and did that through his whole campaign. This symposium is fueled by the American Legion's Be the One initiative. So how important is it to the American Legion? It is so important that we have a representative from our national organization in from Indianapolis. As you've seen the cameras, You've seen the interviews. Here's a De How Henry Howard. He's in the back off the side over here. He may stop and ask you questions for an interview or to be filmed. I hope you're all okay with that. Uh, he is the Deputy Director of Media and Communications for the American Legion. This program started with a conversation with Joe Young, uh, Sergeant Major Joe Young, uh, Bob Bronson, who's mem they're both members of the American Legion here in Baldwinville, and myself. Bob is the second vice commander, if I got that properly, of the uh, Department of Massachusetts uh, DAV. And the co conversation was pretty simple. You know, we ought to do this, how to do this, and so on and so forth. And that went on for, for a little while. And then on Memorial Day, uh, while well, some of our honor guard was out making the rounds to the different cemeteries in town and the monuments and giving the honors for Memorial Day. Joe and Young were sitting still at the Legion. I said, hey, Joe, Secretary Poppy is due to be up at the Veterans Cemetery in Winston. Let's go up and talk to her. And we did. She was the first person that we got on board, and it was, Jim, anything you need, we will get it done. This is too important not to do. Then it became the task of learning about suicides, for my, certainly for myself and a few others. And we had to address the, um, just what it is. And we reached out for professionals that do this each and every day to address suicide prevention, whether it's just veterans, non-veterans, whatever it may be, and the mental health. And these people do that each and every day. Then somehow I made a call to General Greg Smith, and Joe Young I forwarded a, a article he wrote for, I believe it was the Army Times, and addressed suicide. So I gave him a call and told him it was all Joe's fault that I'm calling him and getting him to be a moderator today. That lasted about two seconds before he said, yeah, I'm in. Uh, so that's why we're here. Thank you for coming. Thank you to all of our speakers. A special thank you to my wife, who's probably not here, for putting up with me for the last six months, uh, putting this program together. So again, thank you all. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Greg Smith. I'm a retired uh, U.S. Army Brigadier General, I'm pleased to be here this morning. I was honored when Jim asked me to be the moderator. I said I'd do it, but there was one condition that I was not going to sing the national anthem. Jim said, that's okay, you can come and do it anyway. All right. Well, Jim sat down, but I'm going to call him back up here again. Because, you know, uh, in the military... Uh, general officers carry their coins around with them. 
And when somebody does something exceptional, generals award their coins. And I'd like to do that this morning. Jim, thank you. Thank you. For Sometimes we wonder what difference can one person make? Well, Jim Brio sitting here is an example of the difference that one person can make because he's filled this hall this morning and we're all here because of him. Thank you, Jim. Uh, just by way of explanation, on that coin is a, is a very strange uh, uh, bit of writing that you might see. It says Fogabala, and what it is is it's Gaelic for lead the way. And I have that on my coin in honor of my ancestors who fought in the Irish Brigade as uh, illiterate Gaelic-speaking Irish immigrants. Jim, you truly lead the way. So it's, it's fitting that, uh, that you have that coin this morning. I'd also like to uh, express my thanks to um, a longtime friend and colleague, um, and he really uh, has rolled out the welcome mat for us this morning. Um, I am a former uh, public school educator, and I have to say I have never seen a superintendent of schools carrying tables before in my life, but that's who Dr. Chris Casavant is. Chris, thank you for hosting us this morning. You are truly, you know, Chris, we worked together for, for many years, years ago. I don't think I have said many nice things, but I am going to say it this morning. You lead by example, and that's an inspiration. Thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, uh, Senator Gobi uh, quickly uh, recognized that we are honored today to have uh, American Legion past national commander, Commander Jake Comer with us. Commander Comer, would you please stand? So ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be here today. Um, and, and, and I guess I'd like to just take a minute to explain why I'm honored to be here today. So um, I wore the uniform of our country proudly for 38 years, as many of you did. Um, my last assignment was uh, to have the privilege of commanding the Massachusetts Army National Guard. Um, during the time that I was commander, uh, it was uh, a time of, of real challenge. Uh, elements of the Massachusetts National Guard served all over the world, including combat deployments in Iraq and combat deployments in Afghanistan, as well as peacekeeping missions um, in, in far-flung places. In addition to that, uh, during the time that, that I was in command, the Guard saved lives. I saw that in floods, blizzards, hurricanes. And towards the end of my tour as commander, I watched them safeguard the city of Boston after a horrific terrorist attack. And I was pleased of the role that we were able to take in bringing the terrorists to justice. But amidst that time, of honor and challenge, I faced the toughest, toughest task or tasks that I ever faced during the time that I was in uniform across all those 38 years. 12 times I presided at funerals for young men and women who took their lives by their own hands. And the hardest part of the funeral honors, which are in, in so many ways so beautiful, was to take the tightly folded flag of our country, to take a knee in front of a mother, a father, a wife, a husband, a lover, and to say these words, on behalf of the President of the United States and a grateful nation, please accept this flag as a symbol of appreciation for your loved one's honorable and faithful service. And then at that point, the presiding officer transfers the tightly folded flag to that loved one. 
it's inevitable that you make eye contact. And in that moment, I was conscious of this electricity, this horrible, terrible electricity that goes back and forth, because that is the end. It's a moment of intense sorrow. And when I stepped away from the grave, I always said to myself, why? Why does this strong, capable soldier, airman, first responder, this person who has pledged their lives to save others, why did they take their own life? You know what? I'm never going to understand it. You'll never understand it. And even the wise people on stage with me today will never understand it. But we're gathered here today because there are things that we can do to minimize, to prevent, to help save somebody else's life. We'll never know the darkness that is in the souls of the people who finally decide to take their own lives. But I know this, on this beautiful day, there's light, there's hope. There's hope because there are service providers out in the hallways here on stage who are standing ready to help people who are sinking into darkness. They are light. They are hope. You are light and you are hope because you care and because you're here today. So thank you all for being here. I salute you and I applaud you for coming today. Now let's hear for some people who are here to help and will bring their wisdom and their services today. First, I'd like to introduce um, Massachusetts American Legion State Vice Commander Lisa McPhee, who's going to speak quickly about the important role of the American Legion Be the One program. Commander. So I've been ordered quickly. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On the behalf of the American Legion National Commander Vincent Jim Triola and American Legion State Commander Sally Nay, I bring their greetings on this very important symposium. Again, my name is Lisa McPhee and I'm the Department of Massachusetts Vice Commander. The American Legion has always been part of the American Foundation when it comes to bringing critical issues involving veterans to light. Veteran suicide is one of those critical issues. The American Legion has continuously brought important pieces of legislation to Congress from the GI Bill, Agent Orange, POW, MIA Accountability, VA Reform, the Blue Water Act, the Legion Act, and most recently, the PACT Act. The American Legion has never shied away from difficult challenges. Our organization embraces challenges when their concerns are American heroes, our veterans, our brothers, our sisters in arms. Now the American Legion has a new critical issue. And because of this issue, the American Legion has created a new campaign called Be the One to help facilitate an end to veteran suicide. Be the One program goals are to destigmatize asking for mental health, to explain it's okay to ask for help to create an opportunity for those with mental health issues to speak freely and get the support that they need, not to be afraid to ask, provide pair-to-pair -pair support and resources in the local communities like this, like this event here today, to connect with FDA-approved therapeutics for veterans who identify, to be identified for veterans, and find uh, recent and community support. There are many veterans in this room, and many have asked, what can I do to help as a veteran? The American Legion encourages you to be the one to advocate for those in need by talking to your fellow veterans about how they are feeling, to encourage, to ask for help, encourage them to ask for help when they need it. It's okay, as I said, to ask for help. I know there are millions of people willing, ready, and able to help and finally, remember, their families and their friends do care. The veteran is not alone. Veterans help veterans in the American Legion way. What about family members? How can you help? And veterans suicide. Be the one. Ask veterans in your life how they're feeling. Listen to them. Ask them if they need to talk. 
And finally, reach out when you know you see a struggling veteran. But more importantly, when one of your youth, uh, veterans are in a crisis, there is a new um, veteran suicide line. Uh, it's, a, it's a national uh, phone number. It's 988, and then you press 1. That particular phone number is, and that particular pressing of the 1 is strictly for veterans, and you will get immediate help right then and there. If everyone has a, a phone on them, they should have that in their phone. There are other ways to help. There is also a, a text line, and the text number is 838-255. Or they can visit the VA Crisis Line website, which is veteranscrisisline.net. Local American Legion posts are a major part of the success of the Be The One program. Posts can help end veteran suicide by educating their members, other veterans, the civilians in the community about the, the campaign of Be The One. Display resources in your posts, in your community. American Legion has downloadable resources for the post to use when the posts have events. Please share these events and, and your success stories on a legiontown.org platform. There's also another program that the American Legion started in 2019 and it was called the Buddy Check. It was a campaign to start comradeship with, with posts in their members, to reach out to the veterans in their areas. The program was very successful in the first year, potentially saving lives, especially in 2020, through the COVID-19 pandemic, as the winter months drew near, affecting the mental health and the well-being of isolated veterans. Together, we can, we will, and veteran suicide. We cannot afford to fail our heroes in need. Thank you. Still on the purpose. Was that quick enough? That was great. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for a second. I'm just going to cut people. <laughs> you know, without NCOs, generals would be lost. <laughs> Um, next, uh, our next speaker is uh, a, a professional warrior, um, someone who in my time in command, when we were baffled by uh, mental health concerns, behavioral health challenges, and the aftermath of suicides and their effect on the force, I would turn to him for his wisdom and guidance. In those days, he was Colonel John Rodelico. I don't know how many titles I'm supposed to use. Uh, today he is Brigadier General, Massachusetts, John Rodelico. He is also Dr. John Rodelico. Uh, John is the clinical director for the Massachusetts Veterans Services SAVE team. He is also um, a, a principal uh, staff member at uh, McLean's Hospital in uh, Belmont, Massachusetts, an esteemed professional, a wise man, and uh, here to, to give us some of that wisdom today. John? Thank you, General Smith, for those kind words. Um, uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and good morning. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do today is uh, not go on a big speech. Uh, I was, I it was hard for me, but I left all my PowerPoints at home today. So I'm just going to go off the script. I'm not going to read it. I'm really just talking off the top of my head. Um, as a clinical psychologist, which I've been for 30 plus years, maybe 40, uh, around there, uh, I've um, had to deal with suicide my uh, whole career because it's part of my job. And I'm as baffled as everybody else about why. Um, but I never got as intense as I should have been about answer, trying to answer that question until I was deployed to Iraq the second time um, uh, in 2006. Um, at that point, it was striking how we're in the middle of a surge and people were taking their own lives. It just, I couldn't put the pieces together. Up to that point, I'd been an academic clinical psychologist um, 
and I thought I knew a lot of answers. I didn't know anything. So since then, I have tried my best to try and answer that question, and I'll continue to do that. The only way I can describe it um, is it's an attempt for a person to solve a problem of intense psychological pain and sometimes physical pain. And that was the answer at that time. And I'm going to get back to that at the end of this short speech. <laughs> um, but I do have to throw, I can't, can't be on a, on a, on a, at a podium without going, rattling off a couple of statistics, but uh, there'll only be three that stick in my head all the time. Uh, the first one is in 2020, we lost um, 6,143 veterans. That statistic is, takes everyone's breath away. The one that takes my breath away more is that's the 20th consecutive year that we've been over 6,000. Um, and one of the things that, the third one, and I promise this will be the last one, um, is um, the second highest cause of death for veterans under 45 is suicide. We'll, we all in this room will continue to move forward and we will continue to try and find the answer. Uh, and when we do, we'll act on it. To move on here, I do want to talk about vulnerability. There's two things clinically I'm going to talk about. One is vulnerability to suicide, and the other are, of course, warning signs. Um, a very smart man that I, that I met several times in my career, Matt Nock, came up with this vulnerability scale, if you will. And he did a lot of research on it. He actually did research uh, down in Washington for the STARS program, which is a suicide prevention program, research program that the Army had started. Um, one of the things, one of the vulnerability factors, there's several of them, but I'm just going to highlight a few, uh, is a family history of suicide. If somebody has a family history of suicide, uh, they are vulnerable. Again, this doesn't mean they're going to take their own life. What it means is they're vulnerable, just like some people are vulnerable to heart disease um, or other types of illnesses. Um, but a family history, and to elaborate on that, um, peer relationships that have taken their own lives. Um, their people are vulnerable around that. Of course, uh, trauma, uh, PTSD, pain. Um, and I add to that myself, this isn't my friend's uh, research, but I add to that substance use disorders, which is my specialty. Um, and what I call that is the perfect storm. If someone has um, PTSD or any kind of trauma background, um, they're in physical pain, um, maybe a TBI, um, and you add a little alcohol on top of that, and you've got a perfect storm. Um, so that's another vulnerability. Um, a cognitive style of rigidity, meaning yes, no, black and white. This is the way it should be. Um, and as veterans, we all tend to fall into that way of thinking many, many times. Um, one of the things that specifically that I've seen more recently um, is when people are transitioning out of one role into another one. Now, many of veterans in the audience, uh, veterans up, up on the stage, um, we've all done transitions because we're veterans. Um, and that is one of the biggest vulnerabilities that I've seen, um, particularly within the first, first and second year of that transition of retiring, moving from one job to another maybe. Um, it could be even something transitioning, geographic transition in some way. Um, but the, one of the, uh, after all of those, the other one is a vulnerability of people who have not found a purpose in life. That one hits, that one is really striking. People who do not have a clear purpose in life are more vulnerable to suicide um, than, than those who, who, who do. Um, and one of the things that is also uh, puts, a, puts, let's say, a, a, a red flag up for me is when uh, I know a veteran that has not maintained military friendships. 
Now, I don't mean that they have to be seeing them all the time, where they might even not they might not even live in the same same state. Um, but if they want nothing to do with any military friendships after they leave, um, we found that that's a vulnerability. So again, those are vulnerabilities. Um, now, what are the warning signs? Well, um, goes back to um, one of the warning signs is an increase in uh, alcohol use, maybe the beginning of drug use, uh, drug abuse in some way. Um, the other thing, like I had said before about my uh, attempt to understand the problem of this intense psychological and f or physical pain is a hopelessness that occurs. Hopelessness is one of the things that we all look for when someone is hopeless about not even able to look at the next hour. And I will talk about how intense these decisions are for people uh, in, in, in a few minutes. Um, or that they've become a burden on somebody. That everyone would be better off without me. That kind of talk. More anger, more impulsivity. If you're seeing more anger or impulsivity with people, that should be alarming in some way. Um, as I said, an increase maybe in substance abuse, but also because I'm an addiction psychologist, um, as a specialist, I also worry when people are in their early sobriety um, and um, they're not happy within it and they show a lot of these other warning signs early on in their sobriety. Isolation which is why, um, you know, the, the idea uh, that we've had for decades in, in the military services of, of uh, battle buddies uh, is, is really, is literally life-saving as we heard. It's literally life-saving. Uh, so isolation is, is another big warning sign. And sleep difficulties. I think we don't pay attention to sleep difficulties because when somebody doesn't sleep, what happens? get depressed, you get irritable, I can go right down these warning signs if someone's not sleeping. So that is something uh, to also look out for. Um, to add on to these, the list goes on and on and on, but I'm going to wrap these up because one of, one of the ones that um, that's really important, and this is when, then, uh, when people get real um, nervous and need to really take an action is when the person starts ha talking about not wanting to live anymore, when the person starts to have suicidal ideation, uh, the veteran starts to look for means, um, firearms, uh, maybe saving pills, um, uh, things of that nature. Um, again, and as I mentioned, feeling trapped um, and also getting revenge or being reckless about how they're talking about getting revenge on a person or on an organization of some kind. So those are the warning signs. One of the last comments I want to talk about is how we, as clinicians, how we've made a mistake over years about how we thought about um, suicide. There's, a, there's actually a book out now uh, by a, a, a fellow veteran, uh, Craig Bryant, um, who was deployed, I believe, in 2007. Um, and um, he's at the, the Ohio State. Um, and he's got this idea that as clinicians, as behavioral health professionals, we always looked at this at, in a linear way, meaning that somebody has the idea that they want to die. They develop suicidal ideation. Um, then they have a suicidal intent. Then the planning starts. Then, this, then the attempt occurs. So it's like one line that goes like this, but it progresses one after the other. It's linear. What Dr. Bryan has said is any one of those blocks, if you will, or any one of those positions can lead to a suicide attempt. And that's because it's not a gradual thing. We've all maybe unfortunately known people who have taken their lives and no one knew it. No one could see it. That's because there's this intense surge of hopelessness in that person's life at that time, where two days before, it wasn't there. Um, so when you see the signs that I just outlined, 
it's important to have the conversation with them. And I know I'm early on in the program here, so you're going to be hearing a lot more about this. Um, uh, but it's important to take action at that point. I'll, I'll be, I'm going to end there, General Smith, because um, I know there's more people here. You were hiding in the wings, sir. <laughs> um, but I will be uh, up here to take questions later. So thanks for having me, and um, I hope um, you enjoy the rest of the day. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rodolico. Um, and as uh, Dr. Rodolico mentioned, he'll be here for questions and answer when we finish our, our first session. Um, next, I'd like to introduce um, someone who, while Jim Brio has been the driving force behind this event, uh, someone who's operated kind of behind the scenes and sort of made this happen by filling in the, the uh, quietly filling in all of the empty spaces has been Master Sergeant retired Sheila Pelletier. Sheila is uh, an Operation Iraqi Freedom veteran um, and she is going to be speaking about the Disabled American Veterans uh, National Women's Committee. Sheila, I'd like to present you with, with my coin, or I should say, Master Sergeant, I present you with my coin. Thank you for making this happen. Hi. I'm Sheila Pelletier. Um, I was here in the National Guard for 30 years. And I was just recently assigned a, on the National Women's Committee team. So I reached out to the DAV to ask for some um, notes on what I could speak on, and I actually had a national uh, communications person write my speech for me. And then today I realized I didn't put anything in there about the women's uh, veterans. So I worked with uh, Major Murphy, and we jotted down some notes so that you understand that women veterans are actually the fastest growing population in the military. And right now, the, the population is, uh, for military people is 1% of the whole population. And the women veterans, the women in the military now make up 10% of that and we're increasing every year. But we also have a higher risk um, to die by suicide than our civilian counterpart. And that's because of our experiences and what we're going through. And it, studies have shown that it, we actually, those that have experienced military sexual trauma, have a, even a higher risk of suicide within the women's population. And we're more likely to choose a weapon um, as our means for trying to commit suicide because we've been trained and it's a more um, comfortable device than uh, these other means. And I know that that has changed over the years because back in the 70s and 80s, they, women would choose a more cleaner method because they were worried about how um, people would clean up after them. And now with women veterans in the population growing, they're choosing a weapon because they're more comfortable with them. So on to my speech. While it's great to be surrounded by my fellow veterans and emergency first responders, today's topic is a grim reminder of the cost of service. Suicide is a dark yet critical issue with the DAV and the broader veteran community, and preventing them should be the top of our priorities. But discussing suicide is a bit of a paradox. It's a topic that understandably stirs uncomfortable, maybe even traumatic, thoughts and memories. Yet, it is often on the minds of veterans. Too many of us are intimately familiar with the weight bestowed after learning of the untimely passing of a colleague, friend, or loved one. 
Too many of our veterans experience crises. Suicidal thoughts are unfortunately not uncommon for those who have worn our nation's uniform. And the numbers are staggering. In 2020, the U.S. had one death by suicide every 11 minutes. Suicide affects all ages. And just a few years ago, it was the top nine leading causes of death between people ages 10 and 64. And I find that astounding, 10, 10 years old when we were supposed to be playgrounds, but 10 to 64. And you can include some of the military children in here before it being young, uh, so um, low. When it comes to veterans, everyone knows about the grim 22 veterans a day statistic, but there are signs that that number is reducing. The updated numbers show that about 17 veterans take their own lives each day. This decrease, while noticeable, is not nearly enough. I used to think of suicide prevention as the job of doctors, social workers, and mental health professionals. But what we know about suicide is that anyone can step up in and save a life, and you don't have to do it alone. Here are a few resources that, many rescue, that may rescue someone on their worst day. A new nationwide phone number went live this summer where people in crisis can speak directly to trained mental health professionals, and it's as simple as remembering three digits, 988. Just pick up the phone, dial those numbers, and for veterans, pressing one connects you to the veteran crisis line. But 988 is for everyone. There is no need to be a veteran. This new number is a great resource. The use and potential benefits that can have on anyone in crisis are priceless. But we must ensure we get to our veterans and first responders before they start spiraling. The relationship between suicide and economic security is complex, but one study finds that the suicide rate increases by 1 to 1.6 percent for every one percentage point increase in unemployment. One's journey from injury to recovery is not complete without meaningful work. If you know a veteran looking for a job, DAV has job fairs in many major cities across the country with our partner recruit military. An impactful job, a means to support a family, to put food on the table. Many take that for granted, and when some people are thrown into joblessness, they are thrown into uncertainty. And that's one way our mental health takes a toll, allowing dangerous thoughts to creep in. I would be remiss if I did not mention a new powerful employment tool, DAV, acquired earlier this year, Patriot Boot Camp. The dynamic entrepreneurial program helped veterans, military members, and spouses become creators, invent inventors, and entrepreneurs. Whether you're a current business owner or an aspiring employer with a business plan, DAV Patriot Boot Camp can help. The role of unemployment and financial hardship cannot be overstated. A common thread of suicidal thoughts and behaviors is helplessness. But there are resources to help, and you can learn more about this one at patriotbootcamp.org. If you take one thing away from this, let it be that you can be the first line of defense in preventing suicide. The numbers and resources can be a godsend, but it doesn't replace our personal connections, particularly as veterans. If you see anyone struggling, tell them they aren't alone. Point them in the right direction, but above all else, be there for one another. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, and, and thanks for, for all you've done to make this happen for us today. Um, our next speaker is a person that I know as First Sergeant Uvred, but I've come to learn that he's also Pastor Mike Uvred in, in, 
in retirement from his, his military duties. We have been conscious about physical health, certainly behavioral health, uh, mental wellness, in terms of the, the fight against suicide. But perhaps we've neglected the area of spiritual health. So to talk a little bit about spiritual wellness and the concept of moral injury, I'd like to invite uh, OIF combat veteran first sergeant and pastor Mike Uvrad. Like General Smith said, I'm Pastor Mike Uvard. I'm a retired Master Sergeant, also known as a First Sergeant. I'm a 37-year veteran of the Army, and I'm also a PTSD survivor. Let me say that again. I am a PTSD survivor. I made it through the dark days, and I'm here to tell you, you can make it through the dark days also. So when I, uh, when I meet up with some of my old soldiers and they say, how's it going? And they find out I'm a pastor. The first thing they say is, well, after they stop laughing, the first thing they say is, wow, first sergeant, you were so, so intense. And yeah, that's a pretty good way to explain who I was. I was intense. I could get into a role or in a mood where I would throw out some pretty colorful words and expressions that would make a statue blush. And I was a master at the first sergeant's number one weapon, the knife hand. I would get your attention with this. I was so good at it, I one time made a, one of my platoon sergeants cry in front of his soldiers. <laughs> it was kind of funny at the time, but uh, now I'm sorry I did it. And it's still kind of funny, I'm sorry. But uh, that's who I was. Then I took on a new role in retirement, and, and now I, I talk to veterans about faith and, and how your faith, no matter what it is, can help you through some, some really difficult times. I don't like standing behind a podium. So today, I'd like to talk to you all about balance and balance in your life. Uh, recently, uh, my wife and I and my brother-in-law and his son were on a trip to Kentucky. Now, that's a pretty long trip from Massachusetts in a car. And as with any long trip, you strike up some really strange conversations. And we're traveling down the highway through Connecticut, and I'm driving, and I look up, and there's a high-tension wire. And well, what do you think's on the high-tension wire in a cool winter, you know, fall morning in Massachusetts? Birds, right? So my demented mind starts thinking, well, how the heck do those things not get electrocuted? Well, uh, that struck up a conversation for about 10 minutes, and... Uh, Finally, my wife, with the assistance of her best friend, Google, found out uh, how birds don't get electrocuted. Huh, go figure. And I know that if I step on a wire, and I've learned this by the time in the military my working with emergency management, if you touch a downed wire, that's one of the fastest ways to see God right now. So we don't do that, but the birds get to do that. So I'm like, huh. So we're driving along a little bit more, and I'm still thinking about the birds on the wire. How do birds balance on that wire? And we laughed a little bit, and I said, you know what? The only explanation I have is bird balance. They've got to have bird balance or something. So when everybody in the car stopped laughing at my, my theory of bird balance, goes back with her best friend Google, and finds out, and she's scrolling through, and scrolling through, and scrolling through, and then all of a sudden she puts the phone down, and she gets real quiet. I just keep driving, and I look over, and I say, and? She says, 
bird balance. I'm like, really? I was right. Because she's always right on top of it. She wants to debunk any of my theories. She, she, she revels in it, you know, making me say, yeah, you're wrong. But actually, I was right this time. So I keep driving. Huh. Bird balance. <laughs> so we thought about that, and we found out that birds balance similar to people. We have a gyroscope in our inner ears that help us balance, to keep us balanced. But birds, birds have another organ that helps them balance. It's called the LSO. And the LSO is located at the base of their spine. And it's a, it's a globby mass organ that helps them balance on wires. Imagine that. The bird's ass helps him balance. Man, I should be able to balance on anything. You know, if some of you we can do a flamingo balance here. So I was like, well, why do birds have this special balance? How do they get this special balance? And I said, well, there's only one reason that birds have this special balance. And it's because God, bless you, God gave it to him. Well, did God give me the ability to balance on a wire? Because I'd be out there with my friends. Hey, uh, what do you think about the Astros in the World Series tonight? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Hey, and uh, hey, look, a French fry, you know. But we don't have that kind of balance. And I'll put this back here. He gave us, he gave us balancing tools. And I like to think that in life, we have two bags. We have one bag that is our physical bag. And we have another bag that is for intellectual stuff. So what goes in our physical bag? Well, work goes in our physical bag. Home goes in our physical bag. Our kids, sports, dance lessons, all go in our physical bag. We got gym. Paint the house, mow the lawn, and even go shoe shopping with our spouses. All in our physical bag. And it gets to the point where that bag becomes as heavy as Thor's hammer. Whoever lifts this bag, if they are worthy, shall possess the power. See? I'm not worthy, evidently. How do we lighten the load of our physical bag? In the Army, we're taught the five pillars of resilience. The physical, emotional, social, family, and what I think is one of the most important pillars of resiliency, spirituality. Well, how do we make that bag lighter? We add faith to our other bag. As we begin to explore our faith, we take the first steps and admit to God that we have an issue, that we're not okay. But God tells us it's okay not to be okay. In 1 Peter, it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. It tells us we have a source to relieve our anxiety in life. Cast it upon him because he cares for you. As we work on our newfound faith and we begin to get more balance, we continue to add faith. It doesn't happen overnight, but over time, with more faith, our personal bag becomes lighter until that point 
we begin to feel our recovery, refreshed and renewed through faith. We learn by accepting it's not, it's okay not to be okay. Faith can and will heal. I'm proof of that. There was a time, like Thomas, I too doubted. But I saw. I began to believe. And over time, my faith gave me new hope and a new beginning. Look at me. I'm a troubled soldier, a first sergeant, leader of men, who admitted his fallings, his shortcomings, and became a man of faith. And I promise you, as with me, it can and will do the same for you. So I'll be here all day. If you'd like to talk to me, I'll talk to you. I just love talking to veterans. It's one of the things I seek out to talk to veterans. And it's not always, we don't always talk about faith. But most of the times the conversation comes around to faith. And... It's just a way. It's another tool in your toolbox. It's one that we avoid sometimes because we're afraid. We don't know how to start it. And that's the most difficult part of any road to recovery is that first step, that step that we knock on a door or we call a friend and we say, I'm not okay. And we're here to tell you that you can be okay and it's not a bad thing. I know plenty of survivors of PTSD and suicide attempts, and they all say the same thing. It's okay not to be okay. You can survive not being okay because you have faith, and you have friends, and you have a community of veterans that we all desperately care for each other. If you're a veteran, you could meet another veteran who is two decades served before you, and you treat them as a brother or a sister. You love them like you love your own family. And it's something that the civilian population really doesn't understand that our connection runs deeper than what they can imagine. We're a family, and families look out for each other, and they take care of each other no matter what. And I tell you, you can do that through faith. Thank you.